Welcome back to the workshop, everybody. Your good friend Walter here. So glad you could be with me today. I've got something to share with you. A friend of mine dropped off this old plow plane. And uh, I thought it was pretty amazing and uh, I offered to clean it up for him. And so I did. I, uh, I cleaned up all the threads, got all the dirt off of them. I took out the depth adjuster mechanism, cleaned that, cleaned the threads, re-cleaned them, cleaned them again. I think I cleaned them six times. Uh, it works perfectly fine now. And uh, cleaned the wedge, sharpened one iron because the iron that I have a duplicate of, this one here, it's about three sixteenths of an inch or so had a chip on the corner so I figured I'd sharpen that one. The others don't have any chips so I'm leaving them alone for right now. So the topic for today is tools and redundancy. So this has probably been several decades since this plane has been taking shavings. Why? Table saws and routers kind of replace this task. All right? That's kind of an interesting shaving. That one came out straight, and the other ones are coming out curled. <laughs> oh, you never know. But basically, you can put a, a dado cutter in your table saw, and you can plow that groove you can get a router bit and you can plow that groove. In fact, they even have dedicated um, uh, molding planes like a tongue and groove and you could plow a groove. So the tool did not become redundant. It did not become obsolete. It's just that there were more mechanized methods that were widely accepted. And why were they widely accepted? Because of the perceived speed. And um, it wasn't so much for the small cabinet maker. It wasn't so much for you and me. It was for the person who had to make a hundred of these, two hundred of these, a thousands of these, in a day. That's where the machines took over. Were they as pretty? Who knows? It depends on the function. If, if, was, if this was going to be a joinery groove and it was going to be hidden, nobody ever care. All right? Um, so the tools didn't become redundant in so much as they, couldn't, they could no longer do their job. They, they became redundant because of newer, faster technology for the bigger shops. Not the little guy. The little guy kept using these. In fact, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if these tools stayed in the hands of woodworkers, cabinet makers, joiners, sash builders, house rights, until probably right up to World War II and beyond. Um, after World War II, these probably started collecting dust. Probably just before World War II and then after. Uh, the war messed things up, and then after that it was all, uh, you know, gangbusters. They had to produce furniture and housing and trim it as fast as they could, so it was all machines. But, go out to your favorite woodworking store. Go out to your big box store, go out to a hardware store, or wherever you like, and pick up a corded tool, something with a cord on it, an electric power tool. I guarantee you, if it's a corded tool, it could do its job for as long as the weakest part of that tool stays in good condition. 
if it's a battery operated tool, six months, that tool is out of date. You may be able to take good care of it, keep your battery well charged, keep the tool clean, don't drop it, etc., etc., and you may get several years out of it until the battery itself is no longer capable of holding a charge. Now, that tool is useless. It's, it's trash. So, that's one of the things I like about hand tools. That's one of the things I like. I mean, this, this plane here, okay, this is a Thistle brand, made in Ohio. Pick this up in Maine. It continues to do its job absolutely perfect. Every time I ask it to, no questions asked. Okay? Go out and buy a Festool electric planer and then come back to me in 20 years and tell me if it's still doing its job. Or put a date on it and see if you're in your family, if 50, 60, 70, 100 years from now, if that planer is still going to be usable. Maybe it will be. But unplugged hand tools like these, these are treasures. If you have any of these in your family, keep them clean, keep them dry, keep the rust off of them, and someday, whether it's you or somebody else in your family, may want to use them. So. That's about it for today. I, I will touch on one other topic. The blade that I sharpened for this one, I, uh, I didn't do anything special to it. I just took a little bit of oil and a Scotch-Brite pad and I cleaned the dirt and rust off. These two, which are sort of oddball ones, I tried a rust remover. So that brings us up to another topic which I will address in another video, but rust removal with anything that has an acid in it, you have to rinse and neutralize that acid. And they do affect the tools. For instance, you can see very clearly there's two colors on that blade. That's because the tip is a harder steel and the back is a softer steel. It could even be wrought iron, but I'm going to just say it's a softer steel. So, most likely all of these are laminated steel. That was typical of the era that this came from. But I, uh, I've tried a lot of different rust removers. I've tried vinegar. I've tried uh, toilet bowl cleaner, which is a hydrochloric acid solution. I've tried citric acid, and they all work. However, make the mistake and leave it in just a little too long, and you can ruin a piece. I mean, this is pretty amazing that, and I don't know, I, I probably would have to sharpen these to know for sure, but right where the weld is, this one's not too bad, but this one, right where the weld is, there's a slight crack. Now that could be from manufacture, but it also could be acid eating away at that. So I won't use acid anymore. I did use that rust remover on this and I'm not happy with it. But. Um, a little bit of steel wool, 4-0 steel wool, and a little bit of oil. Clean off the dirt and grime. If you've got something that's so severely rusted, you may have to go through the electrolysis process to really get rid of it, to stop the rust. But that's all. That's all for today. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to know more about this, it is a... Uh, 
and I don't know if you can see it in the camera. It's uh, Jay Dennison, and uh, he was in Connecticut. Um, it was John and a brother, and they made planes around 1829 to 1849 or something like that. I'd have to look up a little more carefully. And the, uh, the irons, the irons are Dwight's and French. Dwight's French and Company. So you can see back then they even had specialized companies that made different parts. And to the best of my knowledge, like I said, this is uh, East Indian Rosewood and uh, Boxwood. Very nicely done. Upon inspection, I would give this a classification of somewhere between a 7 and a 9 as far as quality. There's a couple of dings here and there. But all of the details are crisp, clean, an absolute treasure. So this will be going back to my friend and I'll have to ask him before I give it back to him what he wants me to do with the irons because if he's going to turn around and keep this that's one thing. If he's going to turn around and sell it then I would leave the irons alone and let the, the next owner decide how he's going to treat them. So hope you found this helpful and if not uh, at least entertaining. Give it the old thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed to the channel because we got a lot more videos coming and uh, head out to your shop. Go make some shavings. Walter out.